how the hell you went with the bald hair and the big beard? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> what were that? What were you thinking? I, well, yeah. Yeah. Okay. The bald head was just for simplicity, I don't know. and I would still do that. What's that? Yeah, I know, I know. I heard some grief from it when I started growing it back. They were like, you have Look hair? Look at his head of hair. What it's the? a gorgeous head of hair. And he went bald with the big beard for so long. Yeah. Anyway, it's nice to see him back looking the way he does. <laughs> okay, here we go. Well, his resume as an athlete is quite impressive, but it's the work this former NFL player and CFL standout, Pat Woodcock, is doing uh, right now that seems to be really making the difference in other people's lives. So this brings us to episode 26 of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang, the podcast brought to you by Extension Marketing. And for more information, of course, you can always head to extensionmarketing.com. All right, so we're making fun of the hair as we were starting this podcast. I, I'm used to it now. Yeah. Yeah. I think Mel, your wife, appreciates that some of us were quite honest. For sure. Yeah. She does. She, she likes it much better with some hair as opposed to the bald head, yes. I'm going to just mention that for a time, uh, a quick, uh, well, it was longer. It was like, Oh, it was a long time. It was like six or seven years because my kids would say, Daddy, like, we've never seen you with hair. Yeah. We've seen pictures of you with hair, but can you grow your hair? Yeah. So he has this beautiful head of hair and decided to go bald <laughs> with a big beard for so long. So it's nice to have him back looking normal. We met, and this is how I remember meeting you. Yeah. Uh, I had just started, I think, with uh, CTV. Well, it was, I think, the CHRO back in those days. That's right. Uh, before it was the new RO and then all the name changes. And we met... Uh, reading at a school. We were like celebrity readers at an elementary school. Yep. So we were trying to figure out, it's going back at least 20 years. It's getting close to that yeah. for sure. Yeah, it's been a long time, a lot of different things along the way. But uh, but yeah, I think that's that's pretty much where we started. And in that time, you graduated from Syracuse University, went on to play in the NFL, the CFL, and then the list keeps going on. So yeah. there's a lot to get to. Sure. Uh, and I think when you list that, you know, here you are, a kid from Canada, ends up playing in the NFL, there's there's a lot of story behind it. So yes. you're from here. You're from Canada or yep. the area, right? Born and yeah. Raised. yeah, I was born in, in Nepean, but uh, moved to Canada when I was uh, four or five and mm -hmm. grew up there my whole life. Exactly, yeah. Sports, busy, kid, like how, Everything. what was your upbringing like? Yeah, so started out playing soccer. Um, uh, that was the first one. And then uh, both my parents played touch football uh, when I was growing up. So I was just around that game all the time and they watched football on TV. And so uh, that's the one that kind of stuck with me the more than soccer, I suppose. And so uh, once I asked and got into that one, there was, there was no turning back. Because I would think uh, with your frame, yep. your your body frame, you're, you're not... You're not big. No, you're not for tall. Sure. You're not, you know, yeah. uh, what you would assume a lot of the time when you when you think of a football player. I would have thought with your body type, like soccer, you being in and out and being able to run was going to be your sport. Yeah, I mean, I, and I stopped playing soccer when I was... I think 14 or 15. That's, still, now, that's I, a lot of years in soccer. Today. Yeah, I mean, I was, a, I was a pretty good soccer mm -hmm. player for exactly that reason. I could just run faster than everybody else. Um, I could kick the ball pretty hard. I wasn't particularly skilled uh, in terms of controlling the ball or that kind of stuff, but I was a, I was a good athlete. Um, but I think just my hunger for football was there, and, and I had that, that one attribute in terms of speed and quickness that um, I was kind of able to overcome uh, some of the size limitations or, or things that, uh, that weren't working in my favor. Um, and, uh, and, and I think it, it actually became sort of a, um, a driving force for me too, because I was almost always the smallest kid on the field. So I had to work a little bit harder than everybody else and do a little bit more than everybody else just to make sure that I was uh, playing the way I wanted to. When did you feel like that mindset was there? Like, were you always competitive by nature that you knew, even though you were smaller than the rest, that you had that work ethic to, as you said, work harder, do more to make an impression? Yeah, I mean, I was always competitive. Like, I hated losing when I was a kid. I was that kid that, that would cry after we lost games and stuff like that because it just drove me nuts to lose. Um, but in terms of knowing that I had something um, that drove me more than other people, it probably wasn't until probably mid-teens uh, when I was playing football for Canada. We had a coach who had played NCAA, and he took me aside after practice one day and said, I'd like, I think you have some talent, you have some ability, I think you could do that. You could get a scholarship to go play football. And so that just sort of from that day forward, that became a goal. And then... I started to look at things that I was doing that other people weren't doing or that I could do to get an advantage over other people. And, and sort of that's where it came from. So you actually hadn't had the mindset uh, as you were younger to that in NCAA or playing football. It wasn't like these were like these 
goals you were just trying to be competitive day yeah day. no exactly like i was a i was a huge cfl fan because my that's what my parents watched on tv so i would find and at the time and usually in high school i was a running back for the most part um so i would find the canadian running backs on the roster and find out what schools they went to and almost all of them were canadian schools and so i just kind of went along with that and then when he kind of put that in, idea in my head then i kind of looked into that a little bit i hadn't really you know, I watched it on TV a little bit, but I hadn't looked at the opportunity to go there myself. And so after that, he sort of said that. I said, okay, well, let's do that then. Do you know statistically how many Canadian kids do you end up uh, on scholarship at NC, for, in NCAA programs? Like I, good I don't, football programs? I don't. Because it's, it's, I don't think it's... It's that. getting better. Is it? It's okay. definitely getting better. Well, it's but been it's, 20, it's been yeah, now yeah. Like 25 years <laughs> exactly. since you were a freshman. Yeah, yeah I think, I mean, just the internet and stuff has changed the recruiting so, so much. Because, I mean, for me... And guys laugh their heads off when I tell them this, but like I printed off 20 VHS tapes and I, put them in the mail. I did too. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? So I had to pay uh, these giant yeah. shipping costs to yeah. ship out my videotape. Um, whereas now you just upload a link and every coach in the country sees it. Uh, so it's different. You know, I did that. I went to a couple camps uh, down on campuses and stuff in the States. And um, that ultimately helped more than just the videotape mm -hmm. just the coaches having the opportunity to see you live in person um and i think there's more and more of those camps now as well so i think you know the the recruiting the people recognize now that there are some very talented guys up here in canada and so they, they spend a little bit more time investing in in looking to see who's up here what was the decision behind syracuse uh ultimately it was it met all the criteria um and it was the closest to home uh the the the, the decision came down to syracuse and university of michigan uh and michigan was my favorite team growing mm -hmm. up in high school and so like i had a bunch of like go blue and wolverines gear and all that stuff and uh, they were on tv all the time so i watched them um but they were um, about eight and a half to nine hours away, whereas Syracuse was two and a half, three hours away. Um, everything else was. Were you a homebody? Okay, I, like you must be a homebody, or you like home, or what was. What was the wanting to be so close to home? Because most people would have jumped and gone to Michigan, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I think, you know, um, and I didn't get home very often because uh, I didn't have a car in university. But I think being close enough that my family could come and watch me play every week, mm -hmm. that was important. And friends could come and watch me play every week. I thought that was important. Um, and... Um, I did have a really like I, there was a really good coach that recruited me from Syracuse and I had a little bit more of a relationship with him than I mm -hmm. did the Michigan recruiting coach. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think the, the decision was the, the location. And I think, you know, it, it worked out well because, um, you know, I was with Melanie already in high school. I was school, about so to ask you and I'm like, she could drive when down do pretty much every week uh, <laughs> as opposed to, yeah, probably not doing that in Michigan. Oh. Teenage love. Teenage love. Teenage the decisions you love. Make. And Life like, decisions based on high school girlfriend. But it worked well, out well. It's worked out well. You guys have four <laughs> kids. And, and we'll get to that in a second. I was going to say, you know, here you are. You have an opportunity. Have, and these are two big football programs. So yep. it's not like it was like, you know, these are two great schools with some interesting backgrounds and, and players that come out of them. Yep. Um, but yeah, to make the decision to go closer. Yeah. Uh, it it. it it, it says something. And and Mel would have been yeah. part of that decision factor. For sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Even that young, eh? It was still... It was, yeah, it was, yeah. It was pretty, when, pretty strong right away. When did you... You guys were what? Grade 8? Grade uh, so it started in grade 8. She kind of... She pinched she, me in the cafeteria line, yeah. and I didn't really know who she was at the time. Because she was a year older. She, yes, she was. Is that right? Yeah. She's a year older? And yeah. she went and... We hadn't talked. We weren't yeah. friends. We didn't, because she was older, we didn't really hang out in yeah. all the same groups all the time. But she was telling people, like, I'm going to marry that kid. And we hadn't done anything yet. And then we didn't even date until probably two or three years later. Oh, like a whole whopping grade 10? <laughs> uh, well, grade. no. Well, no, actually, it was quite a few years later then. Because I think it was my last year in high school that we actually started. That you started, started dating. dating. Yeah. And then we dated for eight years before we got married. Yeah. But you met in grade eight. My you would have yeah. your grade eight. Yeah. I love this uh, story. No, it must have been grade. I was gonna. Oh, it may have been grade eight. Grade eight or grade nine. It does. It, yeah, I mean, it's still the it's the same thing. <laughs> it's this 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 meeting as as kids and really having this. So you make this decision to to go to Syracuse. Yep. Were there many Canadian? Like, were there other Canadians on the there team? There were. That oh, there was, wait, wait. There was Jesse Palmer. Uh, no, he was in Florida. 
Yeah. Oh, where did you guys play together? When did you guys play together in New York? In, in New NFL. York. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I'm like, I knew you guys would play together. So yeah, he was Florida. Yeah. So we have. Did you guys play a lot together as kids here? Because played, he's from the city. He was one, I think one year behind me. So I think we only played against each other once in okay. high school. Uh, and then we played against each other once in college. And then we're teammates for a short time in New York there. Mm. But uh, but there were two Canadians already in Syracuse. Okay. Uh, and they were from Ottawa, the the Jeff and Mark Pilon brothers. Really, eh? Yeah. That's they where they there. went. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that worked out well for mm-hmm. me. They were my ride home uh, on weekends yeah. that we had off and that kind of stuff. Uh, so that helped, uh, I think, in terms of having some familiarity there. And then during the time that I was there, there was... Um, probably three or four other Canadians that got recruited. Not all of them stayed the whole time, but uh, yeah, Syracuse. I mean, they're relatively close to the border, so they did a pretty good job of hitting hitting Canada mm-hmm. for recruits. Yeah. Well, they would have done a good job. You had some big players at Syracuse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we were a good team when I was there. We uh, we finished ranked in the top twenty five. I think uh, almost every year that I was there, we went to four of the big bowl games, and um, yeah, played some played some big games. Played okay. at the University of Michigan, and at the time we set the attendance record, there was one hundred twelve thousand people in the stadium. Okay, it's like you play, and I've seen high school football here in in Ottawa. Yeah. I mean, I could see it from my backyard watching over Sir Robert Warren High School. I mean, there might have been fifty, sixty people. Yeah, oh for sure. Uh, what was it like to? to focus and to be in a game setting where you are like what we see on television, looking out at these massive stadiums, like where do, where do you go in your head for that? It's, it's pretty crazy. And I mean, I think the, uh, the college experience, the, the red shirt experience tends to be good if not for the physical aspect of getting ready to play, just for the mental of getting used to that environment. Cause I remember my very first game and I was, I was red shirting that year, so I wasn't going to play. But I was flying during warm up, just all over the place. Mm. Like I was like high just on the energy and, the, and I probably wouldn't have played very well based on just the way out. You know what I mean? And there was zero chance I was getting in the game, but just going through warm up and having the equipment on and all those people. And so you go through a season of that uh, in the red shirt year and kind of get that out of your So system. as a red shirt, you were allowed to get on the field and warm up and do things? Yeah. So for, I, home, okay. for home games, you dress and you warm up and all that kind of stuff. And I mean, that's smart though. You could play like if, yeah. if nine guys got hurt, yeah. they could put you in the game right. and it would use your year of eligibility. But, um, yeah, I mean, there was, there was no chance I was going to play, but they do that for the home games and stuff. Um, um, but yeah, you kind of get that energy out of your system sort of thing and you get used to that environment get used to being in that atmosphere and then it just becomes a football game again you 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 clue it out you zone it out yeah yeah i would think i mean you still feed off it you still feel it but it doesn't it doesn't change the way you play the game anymore like you're just you're used to being in that environment you're you're used to that uh that type of energy and the heat and the sound and all that stuff and i think i i tend to think like i know for me as an athlete I loved going to the bigger schools because we would get an arena full yeah, yeah, yeah. of people, you yeah. know. And so I, I, I remember telling people like at Canadian national championships, there'd be like, you know, a thousand, two thousand people. Right. I'd go to Alabama and Georgia and I'd compete in, and there was 10,000, 15,000 sure. people. Right. And yeah. I'm like, I would be driving to the competition, <laughs> listening to ticket giveaways because you couldn't get a ticket to get in. And it's such a different mindset. American, yep. the American mentality of sports uh college sports ncaa like it is it's almost like a cult like that varsity life is so different and it's hard to explain yeah for sure they are all in i mean they have a a huge population to draw those Mm -hmm. people in as well but uh but yeah they're all in i remember when i went for my visit to syracuse like that was eye-opening in and of itself like you said i've been to cfl games so i'd seen like twenty thousand people in the stands that's about it maybe been to some hockey games which is way less numbers Mm -hmm. than that as well and then i walk into this thing and it's People are out tailgating at eight o'clock in the morning, wearing orange and blue the whole day, and then there's fifty-five thousand people in a dome, so it's crazy loud. Like I, I didn't know what to do with myself just on my visit, and I was just sitting in the stands watching. Like the on game. your visit, you were like, "Oh my god, this could be me." Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's and it pretty was, cool. Yeah, it was, it was nuts. So you're fast. I mean, let's. <laughs> I've, I've seen you and I've covered you. Yeah. Uh, you are fast. That had to have been how much of what you worked on was to be able to excel at speed and to kind of get in your way through crowds on the football field. Yeah, I mean, that was that was the number one thing. When I went to the camp at Syracuse as a high school kid, I was the fastest kid in the camp. And so, we, like you said, even though I was one of the smaller kids in the camp, like how, okay, speed, so people speed. who are listening to this, how big are you? Like what? What's... Uh, five ten, and uh, well, at that time I was about one hundred and sixty pounds, probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So going uh, up against three hundred pounds. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> definitely. Every no, nobody was. 
well, there was a couple guys that were maybe my height, but most everybody was taller than me too. And yeah, we're getting up around, you know, 190, 200 pounds for even coming out of high school. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I was always a small, and, and, and it wasn't for lack of effort. Like in the, <laughs> I had massive lunches in high school because I went, I committed to Syracuse before my last year of, uh, of high school. Early signing in November? Um, I actually committed on Canada Day, July oh, wow, 1st, okay. right before my last year. Yeah. So they, when I went to their camp, they offered me on the spot and I sort of said yes on the spot. Uh, and I wanted to play running back. So they said, well, you, you got to gain some weight to play running back. So I had these massive lunches that people would just stare at me while I was trying to eat them in high school. Uh, didn't really take. And so I ended up being a receiver because I couldn't gain the weight. But uh, but yeah, like uh, speed, speed was my my calling card for sure. Um, and so, you know, my training, I mean, was geared around obviously maximizing that to make sure that I had that uh, asset that was going to be my calling card and allow me to excel, but also building up everything else so that I could, you know, withstand some contact and um, and be able to get through the games when they did catch me. Uh, all right. So let's talk as a receiver receiving from quarterbacks. Yeah. Pretty, you had some pretty good arms thrown your way. I had some very good quarterbacks over the course of my career. Uh, starting in college, uh, played with Donovan McNabb yeah. for the first uh, three years of my college And we're career. talking a Hall of Famer. Likely, yeah, a Hall right? of Famer. Yeah. He was the f ended up being the second overall pick, I guess. And then, yeah, Hall of Fame football career in the NFL. And then uh, when I came to Montreal, I played with Anthony Calvillo. Uh, when I came to Ottawa, I played with Kerry Joseph. When I went to Edmonton, I played with Ricky Ray. So I had some, uh, some pretty good... Hall of Fame arms yeah. throwing me the ball over the course of my my time on the field for sure. What did you graduate with? Uh, business marketing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which you're actually having to use nowadays in your in your current line of work. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, did you like the the process of the student athlete life? Like, uh, I did. Could you balance it? Yeah. Yeah, I did. It? You know, I think um, people don't like when I say this, but I, I always found school pretty easy. And so um, it didn't, I used to drive me crazy when guys would get in trouble with grades in school. I said, like, if you just show up to class, mm -hmm. you're going to pass, right? The teacher's going to see you present. and you're yeah. just going to hear the stuff falling. In. Even if you don't study, the stuff's just going to melt into your head. You're going to get something. You're going to get enough. I, uh, I always thought that if I wrote it down, yeah. that if I saw it and wrote it, that it was at least one time through my brain process that I was writing the right things yeah, down. And I had sure. to be present in class. That was my thing. Yeah. I had to go. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I wasn't be always there. the best studier, but I was always present. I mm -hmm. went to class, and that's that's a big thing. Plus, I don't know, like at, at UMass, we had attendance. Like our coaches, yeah, they got our attendance, they got our marks, they got oh, you know, yeah, yeah. and they, they they've invested money in you, right? 100%. They're gonna make sure. Yeah, we had we had breakfast checks, mm -hmm. so you had to check in at breakfast to make sure you're out of bed and going to breakfast, and then they, for the freshmen, they would go around and check classes, mm -hmm. and the guys that were academically at risk they would go around and check their classes throughout their college yeah. career yeah i think it's wise so we had a mandatory study table yeah. for that first year um and then if you had a certain grade point average you got off of that and you could study on your own so which i guess you did after first year i did oh, yeah. yeah that was nice and it was actually it worked out well because i actually started school in january and so i did good enough in that first semester that they took it off so i only had study table for one semester it was nice <laughs> extra, up extra time to get home and see Mel. Yeah. Okay, so you graduate. At what point are you thinking then, all right, I have a shot. And, and gosh, we had Mark Hatfield in here yeah. uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, and just him talking about just this enormous goal he had set, you yeah, know, yeah. and just the amount of no's, 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 it'll never happen. Yeah. It doesn't seem like you went through that the same scenario you kind of had more of a yes yes path leading you that way more, more or less. than more than most yeah yeah, yeah. i think uh, there was a time uh, early in my career when i was at syracuse when i wasn't playing a lot uh, and first of all that's i didn't really have the nfl in my head uh, at that point i was just looking at cfl being a canadian kid and so the first couple years uh, I hadn't played as much as I want. I did red shirt that year. So that becomes a very long year where you practice, but you never get a mm -hmm. chance to play. Uh, and then the first couple of years I started to play a little bit, but wasn't playing as much as I wanted. And I talked to Mel, I said, well, cause the CFL draft is usually a year before you actually come out of school for whatever reason. I forget the ruling behind that. But anyways, I was going to be eligible for the CFL draft. And I was talking to Mel, I was like, why don't I just graduate? Like forget the last year and come and get drafted in CFL, come play, and we'll we'll go from there. And she kind of talked me out of that and said that didn't make sense. Like, you've started this, you're starting to do well, you know, stick with it. So my last two years, I ended up starting, uh, leading the team and receiving, all that kind of stuff. Now, we weren't a huge passing team, but uh, I did well enough that uh, there was NFL interest and and uh, and I had that opportunity. And so it was, it was, it was nice to um, 
to kind of have that come out of the blue, mm-hmm. I guess. I wasn't necessarily looking for that, but to have that opportunity kind of not fall into my lap, but be a result of the work that I put in, even though I was working towards maybe something else that kind of came in and was a, was a great option for me as well. How, like, what kind of a contract did you sign? <laughs> You know, people think big money, you're all set for life. It's yeah, not yeah. necessarily. No, not yeah. much. I mean, I didn't yeah. get drafted in the NFL. I was a free agent pick. So basically what that means is uh, once the NFL draft finishes, that's on TV, they do the seven rounds. Then the eligible college football players then go and become free agents like anybody else. So you're, uh, you get phone calls from a variety of different teams. And in some cases, it's good because you get to pick your team yeah. instead of being drafted. Um, but yeah, it's not, uh, you don't get the multi-million dollar signing bonuses when you're a free agent, undrafted free agent. So uh, yeah, it was just, it was basically like the rookie minimum contract and you... What is that? Uh, what is it now? I don't know. I think then it was 225, 235. Um, That's but still a lot of money. It will, for sure it is, but you only get it in the season. So okay. yeah, you, you get like a small signing bonus, you get paid like a, a, a little bit during training camp, but then that 225 or whatever the number is for your year is divided up by the 16 games of the regular season. How many did you play? Uh, I got three checks. <laughs> <laughs> 225 yeah. divided by 12 yeah, yeah. So they were good yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. they were good checks, checks. Yeah. so the first uh the very first game i was on the active roster yeah. but i didn't get in the game and then actually as it happened that second week uh there was no game because that was the week of 9 11 and so that was the week that the nfl shut down all the games and so i was on the roster for that game and, and got uh, for that week and stuff and then the, the following week i got released and this is with new york yeah. So what was it like being in New York? It was around the you know. So it goes even 11. more than that. So that that first game of the season we had the Monday night game in Denver. Um and so, you know, it's a primetime game in the evening and it's out west. So we flew home and arrived uh, at the Newark airport, I think around six o'clock in the morning, which is close to when those planes took off. And so we might have, you know, crossed over a little bit in the airport with some of those people. Um, And then because we'd been up all night, I was actually living with Jesse Palmer at the time. So because we'd been up all night, we were sleeping when everything happened. And then our phones just kept boom, 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 ringing off the hook. And uh, Jesse comes running in, turns the TV on and uh, everything's going down. So... And yeah. you're living in New York. Like, are you on, we were on, on the, the Jersey side? We were on the side? Jersey side, but yeah, we were we were pretty close to everything. Oh, that's weird when you think about it, that you were landing in New- Newark. So you would have. There would have been yeah. people walking through that airport getting onto those. Yeah, it was, uh, it was pretty oh. crazy when we kind of sat back and thought about the timing of things and, yeah. and uh, just that situation. It was uh, really, yeah, really crazy. Yeah. And you, you've, both of you as Canadians are sitting there watching this, right? Yep. It's um, it's surreal. It is because I mean that was the first really big event of that nature that happened, mm-hmm. um, and yeah, so we're we're not in our home country, and cell phone service is all down, so we can't get in touch with people um, consistently, um, and um, and yeah, you just don't know what's happening, right? You've seen those those buildings come down and, and that thing happened, but you don't know if anything else is coming after that. What was the reaction from the team? Like, what was the messaging you were getting from the Giants at that time? Well, I mean, the, I, the exact thing I don't know because I think we had practice probably the next day and we and we did practice a little bit before the league said, like, we're shutting down. Um, but we like a, I can't remember, to be honest with you, if they were all team organized, but we were in doing volunteer stuff right away. Like we went and gave blood. We were doing volunteer work where we could, um, trying to help people out. And, and uh, we were kind of active in, in trying to be helpful in that situation. Um, but um, uh, but yeah, it was just, it was, yeah, it was a little crazy. Yeah. A bit of a, bit of a, bit of a I didn't know that. I, I didn't know that you actually, that you were there, but it, yeah. 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 So you end up not playing the game that you were. Yeah. That's the, yeah. Uh, the cancellation. So you end up getting in a couple times, and then what was the release like? Uh, it sucked. You know, it was it was one of those situations where you know I had I had made the team coming out of training camp, which I wasn't supposed to do, uh, but I was still kind of the last man on, mm-hmm. right? I kind of made it by the skin of my teeth, and then. Um, uh, in those first few weeks, we had some injuries at other positions, and so those guys are now on the injured list. So you got to bring in some new guys, and I'm kind of low man on the totem pole, so I end up coming off. So, um, you know, the coach says, "Yeah, you did a great job. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, um, we, we would love to keep you for now, but you know, we got to move the, move these things around." And um, 
So yeah, it just it didn't uh, didn't work in my favor, but um, it was a, a great experience from my end. I said a little bit earlier, like we weren't a huge passing team at Syracuse, and so um, I didn't have necessarily as much confidence in being a receiver, even though that's what I did, uh, as I did when I came out of that camp. Because to go into that camp, I was probably the we had 16 receivers when we started training camp in New York. And so to make the team being in the top seven, I was probably the 16th out of 16 when training camp started. Um, that was It was just a huge confidence boost, even though I ended up getting released, that kind of carried me through the rest of my career. I went up and finished that season in, in Montreal and then played the following season in Montreal. And I just played with a uh, sort of a level of confidence and stuff that I don't think I had even at yeah. Syracuse when I was a starter and a captain. Well. And yeah, you go from that and then you go into your Montreal days. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I know you've got a Grey Cup ring from there. Yeah. You've got a uh, most outstanding Canadian player from there. I right. mean, you talk about this confidence you gained. Not many guys can say they've kind of had this run and come to this league with as much confidence as, as you did. Like For you, sure. You, sh- you shone when you came here. Is yeah, that, I, that, I think. Is that the right tense? You, sh- you shone? <laughs> Sean shined? Sean. I don't know. That's a good I'll one. have to check with my grandma. Check the yeah, thesaurus. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I, I was put into a really good situation in Montreal. Obviously, we talked about Anthony Calvillo, mm-hmm. who was one of the greatest quarterbacks in the league. Uh, when I got put on as a receiver, I played right next to Ben Cahoon. He and I were on the same side of the field. So he attracted a lot of attention and kind of let me work one-on-one against guys. And and so uh, we had a bunch of good receivers besides that and, and, a, and a really great team. So I think I, you know, I got lucky in the sense that I fell into a really good situation and then was just at, kind of able to take advantage of of being in that situation and play with the confidence and the skills that I had. How different was the transition from an NFL organization to a CFL organization? It was a big change. It was a big change. The it's so it's so big business in the NFL yeah. and it's so regimented um, and it's it's getting a little better actually. Like it's better now. When I was with the Red Blacks in '16, it's it's much better than certainly when I started um, in 2001. The Renegades. Uh, well, wait, no, wait, okay, when no, I went to went, Montreal yeah. in 2001, right. yeah. Just in terms of the the atmosphere and sort of the attitude of the players and, and stuff like that. It's still, you know, it's a, the CBA is a, it's a mandatory like four and a half hour work day as opposed to the NFL. You're there all day long. Um, and there's no mandatory off-season workouts. There's no mandatory in-season workouts in the CFL. So I think, you know, that was that was eye-opening for me because the NCAA is very the same, yeah, very much the regimented. same in the as the NFL. They, they mm-hmm. occupy every minute of your day and they want to know where you are and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so there was a bit of an adjustment period and just in terms of getting used to how everything worked and um, how everything didn't work. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, what, again, once you step on the field, football is football. And so that part of it was, was kind of um, the easiest part of the transition. There's just less items in the dressing room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's a smaller dressing yeah, room. Smaller, it's not, not and, as yeah, nice. But probably less showy, right? D- different too, types like, of cars in the parking lot. Yeah, I was, yeah you yeah. know, like there's a different <laughs> level of what you're walking into yeah, in one locker sure. room and another. Do, do you prefer the mindset of more low-key? Or did you like the showmanship of... Um, like, where was your comfort level? Yeah, I don't know. It was, it was hard to say. I mean, I... You know, now for sure, I would say the CFL is better because you play a few years and you're like, okay, well, I know how to do this. So I don't need somebody following me and telling me what to do every Mm -hmm. second of the day. Um, But at the same time, it's kind of nice to be immersed in that and be um, have the expectations of like you're going to be here every minute and we're going to be in here together and we're all going to do these things. CFL can be frustrating at times because certain guys stay and watch the extra film and do the extra practice and the extra workouts and certain guys don't. And so, and there's no way to mandate it. It's just, you you know, either they show up and perform Mm -hmm. or they don't. Um, And that may cost them their career, but at the same time, it might cost your team some games. And so that's, that's a frustrating thing just as you can't get everybody on the same page, but you can't do that in any any league. So I'm going to take it that you were there for the extra film and the extra. Uh, As I got older, for sure. When I was younger, probably not. I didn't do it as much as I should have. But as I got older, yeah, you you figure out that you want to have every advantage that you can get and you... uh, and you, and you take advantage of those things. How much did you put into, and because this is what you're doing now, yeah. uh, understanding the body mechanics of of having longevity of your career by staying healthy and conditioning your body the way it needed to be? This podcast is brought to you by Extension Marketing. They are a new breed of marketing agency that acts as your virtual marketing department, designing and implementing cost-effective marketing strategies that will grow your business. I can speak to this personally as I've been using the extension marketing team to help me launch and grow my business. 
Founder Pat Whalen has been a lifesaver for me, a genuine coach guiding me along the way into uncharted territory. Tell them you're a friend of the show and receive a free one-hour consultation. Check them out at extensionmarketing.com. Yeah, that came probably probably about halfway through the career. And, you know, when you're, you're young, you think you can do anything. Uh, I wasn't a big weights guy in college, uh, even though, you know, that wasn't my it probably it was because it wasn't my strong suit right i wasn't great at i wasn't super strong uh i could just run and so you know i remember saying actually when i left um syracuse when i went to new york it was a very different style of training and then when i came to montreal and found out there was no mandatory training i was like well okay cool i'm not gonna do this at all then uh so i did a very minimal bit of training um and I was fine, but then, you know, I, I ended up getting hooked up with a good coach here in town and he kind of showed me some things and told me that, you know, you need to do this. Um, so I did a little bit, Who but then, here? uh, Lauren, Goldenberg. I was going to say it had to have been Lauren. Yeah. yeah. It was Lauren Goldenberg uh, at the ACC, but then about halfway through your career, right? Your body just doesn't feel the same way, right? You're, you're still fast, but every year they're looking for somebody to come in and replace you who's younger and cheaper and all those kind of things. So you got to keep that advantage, not only against your opponent, but against the guys that they're mm -hmm. trying to bring in to replace you. And that's just the nature of football. Like no matter who you are every year at training camp, they're looking to find somebody who can do your job a little bit cheaper and a little bit better than you are. It's amazing. It's a big it's yeah. such a business. And so, yeah, the off seasons became very much invested in understanding for myself, okay, why are we training this way? Why am I doing this and not that? Why are we doing this this year when we, last year we did this? Uh, just so that I had an understanding of why my body felt the way it did and what we were trying to change about it. Um, and that carried over like from my strength coach to my chiropractor to my massage therapist. I would just talk through the whole thing mm -hmm. trying to figure out, okay, why are we doing this? And why when, why when I say this hurts, do you treat me over here? Right? Just trying to figure out all those different like things. Like the hip to the knee or the knee to the ankle. Exactly. Yeah. So that I can do a better job of managing it myself on a day-to-day -day basis when I can't see them every day. Um, uh, and I think that's something that you have given your athletes that you now work with is, is that understanding. And I want to get to that because I, I kind of want to get on this football, but I want people to be able to take as much information from what you've got to offer yep. into this next part. So let's just kind of, it was, you had a spectacular career. Yep. I, I want to say, what was the decision? I mean, and then let me go through the teams. Cause you, you had, you mentioned them. Yeah. We Montreal. Yeah. And then there was Ottawa and then there was Wizardham. Uh, yes, yeah, so it was Montreal and Ottawa, and then well, there was Washington in there for a little bit too. Okay. Uh, and then uh, when Ottawa folded, I got selected by Edmonton in the dispersal draft. Okay. Spent two seasons there. Didn't really like that, so I came to Hamilton for one year, and then that was the the last year. What was the decision to retire? Like how how do you, how do you because that's that's difficult and yeah. it's a transition. And and you know the unfortunate thing is for most of us we don't get to make that decision somebody makes it for us um so hamilton released me after my last season and uh it had been a really frustrating season we weren't very good um and so you spend you know for me i spend all day kind of running around trying to do my thing but i can only do things when people get the ball to me and so it became a very frustrating and long season um so i had a couple teams that uh called me right after that but they were actually worse offenses than what I had just played in. And I really had no interest in going through another season like that. So I waited and tried to see if anybody else would call. And um, and they didn't. Um, I didn't want to move back out west again. Didn't really enjoy being out west. And we had a daughter now too. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to move out there. So uh, we kind of waited for a year and nothing happened. And so just kind of moved on. Yeah, it was... It was um, you know, I kept training for the first little bit and then just kind of made the decision that, yeah, okay, like, I think we're done. Like, if somebody calls, I'm probably just going to say, no, we're going to move on and, and do other things now. Uh, and this is something between you and Mel. And, and she's she's followed you in all of this. I mean, you guys are moving back and forth. But I, I also want to mention, there were times when you would have looked over on the sidelines and seen her dancing. Uh, well, in Ottawa, yeah, yeah for sure. For <laughs> she, sure. She was. But she a, was captain. Was she captain of the dance team? Yeah, she, yeah. 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 She was. So, I, re I remember doing um, one of the judging, helping her with selections. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So technically that was against the rules, but because we were married before... We ah. are actually on the same team. We were because yeah, they're, not, were okay. they're not supposed to fraternize, right? No, I know that. Yeah, <laughs> but I figured married and then with the kid, you guys were you guys were okay. Yeah, exactly. Once once you had the retirement aspect kind of settled and realizing if someone calls, the answer is going to be no. Yeah. 
you had at that point really started with the uh, Elite Performance Academy. Was that, when did that, when was the creation of that? Because I know it did somewhat overlap yeah. a couple things, so right? So it wasn't necessarily Elite Performance Academy yet. Um, I had decided that I wanted to do some coaching mm-hmm. and um, and kind of pass along. So like I said, those last couple of years, I'd kind of tried to gather all this knowledge. And so it made sense for me to kind of pass it on to people. Um, and so I started actually trying to work with with Lauren at the ACC and um, you know it wasn't it wasn't the best situation he had enough coaches already and Mm -hmm. so he was trying to find stuff for me to do and then um, and then he ended up getting the job with the Montreal Canadiens and so that whole dynamic sort of changed and so I said well I'm just gonna see about starting my own thing at the time I started running we we started a football camp and so I I partnered with Donnie Ruiz who had been a teammate of mine in Ottawa and we trained together at the ACC and so we ran this first football camp and we called that Elite Performance Academy. At the time, we weren't, uh, he was doing some personal training, mm-hmm. but. Um, and painting on the side, by the way. We should mention Donnie's very, a really great artist. Very good artist. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but we hadn't, uh, we certainly hadn't done anything formal in terms of, uh, of what we're doing now other than the football camp. And so, um, sort of the, the time came, I was still using space in the ACC gym and they were going to move and downsize and didn't have space. And so I called Donnie and I said, okay, look, we've kind of talked about this a little bit. Uh, I got to go. I got to get my own space to do this thing. Do you want to come with me? And so let's do it. And so that's when sort of Elite Performance Academy as it stands today was was born. And so that was, uh, that was like 2009, 2010. So you start this. Yep. You're now stepped away from the field, working yeah. on the field with future athletes. Yep. But you've kind of branched it out because you're working with future athletes, young kids looking to follow the path that you've done. Yep. But that doesn't cover all of the, that totally. doesn't cover everything, right? Sure. So when did you really feel like you needed to branch out and take on a variety of different clients? And we're going to talk about it because I know you've got your early morning boot camp with yeah. your hardcore ladies that come in. Yeah. Um, you know, and then I've, because you're very vocal and you're really good on social media. You have a number of very different types of clients that you're working with. Absolutely. And I think, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I started as uh, wanting to coach athletes, mm-hmm. which I think almost every trainer at some aspect wants to coach athletes. Uh, but like I said, Donnie had some experience already doing some personal training. And so when we came together, I kind of brought a few athletes and he brought a few personal training clients. And then that sort of has meshed into obviously everybody doing everything. Yeah. So, you know, obviously we work with the athletes together, uh, whether it's the young kids or the, um, the the pros and the high level athletes. And then we all do some personal training and we have some other coaches on our staff now too. But, um, but yeah, I mean, it really, as a coach, it's great because it helps you to learn how to coach in different ways. Mm-hmm. You can't coach everybody the same. You can't train everybody the same, even within athletes. Uh, and then, but having people of different abilities and different um, uh, fitness levels and different uh, injuries and all those kind of things, it really helps you to program effectively for a specific person uh, and also to be able to adapt on the fly. And uh, so I think that's been great for for me, certainly as a, as a growing as a coach. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously it, it fills up the day, right? So you, yeah, get, so you get people that come in at five, six o'clock in the morning before yeah, work. Yeah, but th- those ones, so you've got, let's let's go through it, like, because yep. you're going to go through the different things. You've got these, and I've seen your your 6 a.m. boot camp yep. class, right? It's it's women, it, a lot of it is the majority majority yeah, of Yeah, 6 a.m. Is, is all women, yeah. And, and it's busy moms, yep. uh, you know, I've seen some, I don't want to say older, but like moving on to the grandmother stages, yeah, you know, yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> um, like, what are they looking for? What do you find most people when they say, okay, they got to the point where they want a coach to help them? Yep. What are they looking for? So almost always it starts with, I want to lose a few pounds or this mm-hmm. or that. Um, but ultimately when they kind of go through the program with us a little bit and, and train with us a little bit, it just becomes um, just living a healthier lifestyle. It becomes feeling better on a day-to-day basis when you get out of bed in the morning. It becomes having energy to get through the whole day without having to drink 19 coffees as I sip on my coffee. It's okay. We have one. Yeah. 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 Um, But, um, but yeah, it's just about like having a better quality of life. Uh, So many of the, the jobs that people have are just sitting all day long. And if you don't have, you know, a sport that you play on the side or some sort of structured activity, then you come home and you tend to sit down again. And so um, it just leads to a wide variety of problems, health, physical, all those things, mental, because you're not getting sort of that endorphin release and the hormones um, 
function that you get from exercise. And so, you know, once once we kind of get them going and stuff, it becomes like I just I need this because I feel better about my day. I feel better when I go to work. I have more energy with my family and my kids. And I'm just a better, happier person when I'm training and I yeah. feel good about Are myself. Are they thinking that that's going to be it when they walk in the door or sometimes just them walking in the door is the biggest step of all? Sometimes that's the biggest step. And I think, you know, the naming of our uh, program has been a pro and a con mm-hmm. because people think it is just high level athletes. And then what we try to get across to people that it's not, it's not that you need to be at an elite level when you come in, it's that we're going to help you find your elite level and help you find your elite lifestyle, um, by, you know, bringing all those factors into play. What's most gratifying for you as a trainer or coach? Like, what do you get most joy out of? You, it's a toss up. You know, I'm still I'm still an athlete and I still have that that mindset. So, yeah, like when a kid hits a personal best or when a kid uh, earns a scholarship or something like that, that's a big rush. Uh, but when, you know, somebody who's never trained before comes in and they hit their weight loss goal or they can lift a weight that they've never lifted before in their life and just that look of uh, satisfaction and accomplishment uh, comes across their face, that's pretty cool too. Okay, how much emphasis do you put on the actual training that you're doing with them and then the nutrition aspect? Because as soon as they walk out of the door, it's on them. Yeah, 100%. And so usually for me, it starts with the training and try to figure out or try to get them to figure out that that they need to be regimented and get them training in a certain way and uh, realize how their body feels. And then once they've sort of... um, I want to say earned that, uh, sorry, I've earned that trust from them, I guess, and that I've gotten them some results just based on training. Then we look at the bigger picture things in terms of how much sleep they're getting, what kind of food they're eating, how much they're drinking and all those kind of things and kind of put together a full package to try to maximize their results. Okay. From your perspective, give me your top five things that you would say to people once they've started to see yeah, um, yeah. results and they're they're leaving the door and yeah. you have five things to say to them, five what things. are they? Uh, get more sleep, drink more water, drink less alcohol, eat more protein, and eat less carbohydrates. Easier said than done. As a general rule. <laughs> As a general As a general rule. rule. All that's individual. Well, the first three are for everybody. Get more sleep, drink more water, drink less alcohol. That's for everybody, no matter what. The protein and the carbohydrates, that's a little bit individualized. And so you got to you gotta do some work and work with that client and figure out exactly how their body works specifically. But those first three are for sure. Uh, you get to go home and have Mel, who's now uh, a holistic nutritionist. Yeah. Uh, and she ran, she has her company, Balanced Plate Nutrition, which I've done some segments and go to the website. She's got some really good yeah. tips. Um, you're living this life and you've got I should add, over the course of this, you know, football, playing, traveling, you have four four kids Four now. kids, yes. Four under the age of... Uh, so our oldest is 11, uh, 11, 8, 4, and the baby's going to turn three next month. It was the four to the three. Like, that was a quick turnaround. Yep. And I, I've seen, they're, they're athletic. They uh, move. Yeah. Like, your your yeah. eldest daughter is yeah, insane. Yeah, she's, she's very good. We have yeah. um, lacrosse provincials next week. Oh yeah. See, yeah. you're you're on the you're oh, on yeah, the circuit on the too. Yeah, 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 we're on the run. How important is it for you then coming home and and practicing what you preach? Right, is oh, is having that? It's huge. Yeah, I mean, it's I mean, it's huge from a business perspective, right? You have to look the part if people are going to trust you. I think you, you and... look better now. Like you look more in shape than I think I've seen you in a, in a long time. Well, is that a fair I to say? I appreciate that. Yeah, I think probably. Yeah. I mean, I think there's. Um, I think as you get older, you realize you can't get away with as many things as you used to before, and so you you make some more changes and uh, make some more adjustments. But um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's obviously huge for for our family and that we want uh, we want our kids to know the things and do the things that we didn't know when we were their age, and so you know. I grew up eating cereal and Eggo waffles and, and um, uh, Cokes and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, like our kids have never had a soft drink. What? Never had a soft drink. We, uh, we Dude, she's do, te- 11. Uh, yeah. Never had a soft drink. Never had a soft oh, drink. Oh, come Unless on. She and she has had party to have snuck it somewhere <laughs> at some birthday party. I don't know. Our kids really? are pretty like, good because we get calls from the parents after birthday parties saying, yeah. Oh, like, sorry, we didn't have something for Kai to eat. She said she wasn't allowed to eat that, blah, blah, blah. So Whoa. she's pretty good. Now, the eight-year-old, he'll probably sneak it. He'll probably take it. He won't call us and tell us that he, or... Like, what? what's off limits? Uh, well, at a birthday okay, so, party, we're fine, usually. Okay. We, we would say still don't drink Coke. 
yeah. uh, or anything like that. Um, but generally, during a regular day, uh-huh. a regular week, like you just can't take food from anybody else. Whatever we give you is going to be good. And we have treats. Like, for sure, we have treats. We have cakes and pies and Melanie makes great cookies and all that kind of stuff. But we offset that. Like, there's vegetables at every single meal and there's fruit at every single meal. And a lot of times we have to fight with our kids to eat like a pasta or a protein, they just want to eat all the vegetables, which is a good problem to Gee, have. That's, that's tough on you. Yeah. yeah. Wow. It's My good. kids I mean, only but... want to eat vegetables. Let me, let me guess. They <laughs> actually like Brussels sprouts too? Uh, well, we don't make a lot of those because I don't like Brussels sprouts. Oh, okay. So those don't get made too often. Um, but like we have to stop the, the four-year-old from eating broccoli because she'll just fill up on broccoli and say, look, you just have to eat a little bit of meat. Yeah. You have to eat a little bit of, of uh, your rice or whatever. But it's it's that you prepared it. And I've seen Mel in the kitchen. Exactly, I mean, it yeah. is. It, you should, there are snacks and there are treats, but 100%. it's like an avocado, fu- it's an avocado <laughs> you know, chocolate are. pudding. Like, you know, but but it makes sense. And so it's yeah. just not about being on the outside, having the processed food. Exactly. I, I think, it's what I'm getting. I think I even, you know, the lifestyle of a child has changed so much even since we were kids, just in terms of being outside playing and the electronics mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff. And so we want to have every advantage that they can have in terms of their development and so if we can maximize their nutrition and their health from that side of things hopefully that offsets the fact that they're sitting down more than we used to sit down what's what do you like with screen time um so during the school year there's no screen time during the week they can have it friday afternoon after school and then they usually get it like saturday morning when they first wake up because they tend to wake up before us uh, on the weekends, or some of them do anyways. Uh, Saturday and Sunday, first thing in the morning when they wake up, if we're still in bed, and then that's about it. They get about two hours or so on Saturday and Sunday. Can, and nothing can I week. send my girls over to your house for a week? We'll, <laughs> well go they, might a week. Not, they might not we'll like We'll go us, a week but... of no outside foods yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, limited uh, electronic time. I mean, yeah. I, I've got you matched on the being active and, and out, yeah, and every sure. night we're doing something, but... Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. and I, I'm guilty of it. And I know, I gosh, I've, I've interviewed nutritionists and doctors. I still give in every yeah. once in a while. They want that ginger ale. I'm, I'm don't let them do the Coke, but okay. I don't know why I think ginger, ginger ale is, better. is any different because <laughs> we both know it's not. Well, no. But I just feel less guilty if it's, uh, you know, it's not an actual, actual Coke. Yeah. For the women that come in, yeah. Um, when you see women over 40, over 50 coming in, yeah. what, what do you like to work with them? Like what's, What's the main thing that you target? Making them stronger. Because a lot of times they they haven't lifted weights very much um, or they haven't done it in a long time or they haven't done it well. They've done some circuits on machines mm-hmm. or that kind of stuff. Um, but just showing them that they can be strong and helping them move better goes a long way towards changing body composition. And then once they're strong and they feel better about that aspect of it, then we can concentrate on certain body parts if that's what they're looking for. But it's, it's strength. And, and I think too, and I, I was focusing on this, you know, as we age, you actually need it more. You need the, you, you need the resistance training. You need yeah. the weights to be able to help with osteoporosis and, and a lot of the other factors that are going to hit us as we age. A hundred percent because lifting weights gives you such a, a hormone response that you can't get from cardio or anything like that from going for a long run. Um, And that hormone response as we get older is crucial to try to keep those hormones pumping, keep the the good, the good hormones pumping and the bad hormones down. Um, Because if you just sit and you're uh, complacent and you're stationary and all those things, then your hormones start to shut down. And that's when you start to age faster. Right. But what do you say to women who are doing these circuits or who are going to do these classes um, and aren't, are at least getting up and are interactive, but have not seen any results? Right. And then you try to say to them, I just need you to try lifting a weight. Yeah. And there's such, there's, uh, there, fear, there, there's fear and they fight, they fight back yeah. and it's like, no, I'm going to get big. I don't want to like, you've got to, you've heard all of this. Yeah. There's just, yeah. I mean, it's just a, just you got to share the information. You just got to explain to them. Like you just, you're just not going to get big and bulky. Like it's just the, those people who people put a ton of effort in getting big and bulky, not just in the way they train, but how much they eat yeah. and supplements they take and all that kind of stuff like it's not easy to just put on muscle but you can get stronger and you can develop some of the muscle that you have create that hormone response change your body a little bit and then that complements maybe what you're doing in your other classes or your long runs or whatever we've got women that need to lift more and are getting stronger you have a gentleman walking in with uh let's say an extra 15 pounds in the midsection yeah 
that's the, and, and you know that's the heart attack that those are where the risk factors are yeah. when you see a man like that walking in who yeah. thinner on the legs bigger on the in the gut yeah where do you start uh, now f- for somebody like that, maybe, uh, we're going to talk about some food and some sleep right away. We always talk about sleep right away. Cause that's a huge one for everybody. Um, nobody gets enough sleep. Nobody gets, uh, as good quality sleep as they should. Uh, and that has a huge carryover in a lot of things. Um, and then, yeah, we're going to talk about food a little bit. Um, because once you're at a certain point, you're not going to see even some results in the gym unless you, you complement it with some food uh, and some adjustments there. So, um, yeah, just kind of the same thing, explaining how food impacts not just the weight gain, but impacts your hormones and everything that's going on with you as you age, uh, how your sleep does that, how excess alcohol does that, um, kind of just being... Um, being a sounding, not a sounding board, but just a source of information um, for them to kind of explain. No doubt they've heard bits and pieces of it through the media or like on the internet or whatever. They've read this, they've heard that, but they don't know how to apply it. And so when you kind of package it all together and say, this is how it applies to you specifically, um, that, that kind of gets them started in the right direction. And then if you can get them to stick to it a little bit, then they can see some results. Yeah, it's the sticking to it. But it's, it's exactly, it's all about consistency. It's really, it has to be a bit of a mindset shift and just say like, this is the way I need to live my life now. If I want to feel better, look better, uh, act better, all those kind of things. Um, if you view it as just, well, I'm going to do this for two months and get some results and then go back to it. It's just, it's not going to happen. How frustrating is that when you see that? It's or tough. You, yeah. It's tough. Yeah. I mean, because you see people who who do really well, maybe right off the bat and they view it only as a short short term thing. And then when they come back the next summer, say like they're in worse condition than they were when they were than they started the first time. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's very frustrating. It's and it's it's a tough it's it's the toughest job in terms of um, in terms of being a coach is that just to, to get people to shift a mindset that maybe they've had for the last 10, 15, 20 mm-hmm. years. Yeah. It, it is. Yeah. It's, and it's the consistency. But once you get into that pattern, you, you chase the endorphins. You For chase sure. how good you yeah, feel. Yeah, you yeah. Chase, once you start yeah. seeing some results, like it's, it's, uh, it's addictive. Yeah. Um, because we were talking about the title, the Elite Performance Academy, it, it, it can be intimidating. It, yep. y- how do you tell people to take that first investment and in finding the right person, the right personality that's going to make a trainer? And I've told people that. Find a trainer. Yeah that you inspires you or that you want to be around or that you want to emulate you, does that make any sense like i for me i'd pick someone who i want to look like yeah for sure you, you know like has the knowledge base to be able to create that yeah like what would you suggest for people then you know you're in you're out in canada stittsville area right yep. um some what do you want people to look for when they're gonna embark on this yeah i think you need to look for uh i think you need to talk to somebody before you actually decide on doing anything because you you have to decide if it's going to be a right fit in terms of personality and 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 mindset and all those kind of things the way they do things Uh, but i think you, you need to look for somebody who i think looks the part i think if they can't um apply the things that they're going to try to get you to apply into their own life, then then that's an issue. Uh, I think they need to have uh, some knowledge background. You need to check into, okay, so what what do you know and what have you done and what do you, uh, what have you learned? And then a, a results, like who have they trained? What are their results? Uh, it is a recommendation from somebody that I know that they've had great results with you, something like that. Um, and ultimately, you know, probably start with a, a shorter term to, mm-hmm. to give things a try and see how things go and um, and make a decision from there. But I think, you know, like we've got clients who have been with us for five, six, seven mm-hmm. years. And so when you find that right situation and you get some results and you feel better, then it's, like you said, it's addictive and it becomes part of yeah. your weekly routine, whether it's two, three times a and, week. And it's a, and these clients, they know. The ones that have been with you five, six years, they know what's coming, but it's also the accountability, right? It's that if exactly. they know that they're showing up w- of what they're going to get. Yeah. And so you have that side of the business, but then I, I really quickly want to hit on because for you, you said biggest thing for you is when a kid signs with yeah. a team or, yeah, or gets yeah. that person. still exciting. How often do you get parents who, who say, I think my kid's got it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> my kid's going to play in the NFL. My kid's going to play in the NHL. You got to make it happen. What, how do you deal with those situations? Yeah, those are, those are tough at times. Cause I mean, you never want to, I mean, you know, you look at my situation and you know, my parents didn't say those things, but, um, at that age, you could have said, well, like, just relax. You don't have a shot in going to the mm. play professional football. Like, let's be realistic. 
but I did. Right. And so you don't want to, basically you just have to temper expectation and you have to explain that just because that's what you want to do, that doesn't mean that you're going to train like a pro athlete today, right? Because the way they train and the way we train a 13, 14 year old is very different things. You still have to make it fun, I would think at 13. You still have to make it a little bit fun and you have to like train them where they're at. Like their body is still growing and they're not fully coordinated yet. And you know, they're, they're, systems are doing different things um, than, you know, a 27 year old who's already played two years and you're just trying to maximize strength. And so you would have that, you'd have the 13 year old kid and the 27 year old current player in there sometimes. Uh, they may cross mm -hmm. over. They tend not to a lot, but what I'm saying is they can't, you can't train them no, the same way. Yeah. Right. Uh, and so basically you got to explain that to the parents, like just because you saw a YouTube video of so-and-so doing this and that, that does not mean that's appropriate for your 14 year old to do. And it's not going to happen in here. So if that's what you really want to happen, you'll have to go someplace else to train and, and hopefully that goes well for you. But I'll have to give you our philosophy and that is we're going to develop everything together. You're going to learn how to move. You're going to learn how to control your body. You're going to learn posture. You're going to learn all that stuff before we get into moving big heavy weights around fast. Because one of the things that, that we're learning is because some of these kids have been so one sport focused, they have not developed. Yeah. Now, like, you know, like you could have a, a young hockey player who doesn't know how to throw a ball yeah. or you could have a football player who, you know, doesn't know how to like they're not incorporating full Yep. body movement and body awareness and functional training for all aspects. Yep. And that's not, that's hindering them in the long run. A hundred percent. I mean, one of the great things, I mean, obviously when we were younger, we played outside a lot more. Yeah. So like I we went to the park and came home when the, uh, yes, climbed fences yeah. and, you know, played tag and hide and seek and all that kind of stuff. Um, but then I also like, I played soccer, I played basketball, I played football, I ran track. Um, I swam, I did all those things. I rode my bike every day and yeah, like you get kids that are from the time they're eight years old, they play one sport, that's it. And so they get really, really good at the skills for that sport, but you take them out of that environment and they have like no athleticism whatsoever. We've had 13, 14 year old kids who are like high level athletes for the sport that they play mm -hmm. at that. They didn't know how to do a somersault. Like they couldn't do a front, like I was trying to demonstrate a front <laughs> roll and they would like lay down on their side and like log roll sideways and then get up and I was like, you've never done a somersault before? And that's, that's mind blowing to me, but you know, that's, that's kind of the state of things now. And, um, you know, you, there's, there's reports and studies and stuff over and over again, that the more sports you play as a youngster, like you're just more well-developed, you develop different levels of athleticism. You work on things that you're not going to get in, in a specific sport practice that still might come up in mm -hmm. that sport game. Um, and it's, um, you know, it, it's, it's tough and it's going to be tough now. Like as my daughter gets to that level, like she played competitive lacrosse this year, uh, we're probably going to play competitive basketball this fall and winter. And so that becomes an increased time commitment, right? And it's less time to do other sports and other things. And so, you know, as a parent and then with somebody with my knowledge and my uh, background, I'm going to have to weigh those things and say, well, yes, I wanted to excel in those sports, but not at the expense of all these other things. Does Syracuse have a good uh, girls basketball program? Uh, pretty good, actually. Yeah? All right. Yeah. Well, we, we still pretty have that mindset in there as well. Pretty good lacrosse, so we'll see. That's good. I'll be watching her. Plus, I've, I've seen some videos of her. She's amazing. Uh, if people are looking to be able to connect uh, with you or have questions, uh, where can they find you? Like, what what's the best route with you? I'm, I'm pretty active on social media. Um, on, on Instagram, I'm uh, at Elite Coach, and on Twitter, I'm Elite Coach 16. Um, and then email tends to work well as well. Uh, tend to tends to work well as well. Um, and that's just pat at eliteperformanceacademy.ca. Should, should we even mention our cruise? I don't see why we wouldn't. <laughs> no, I know. Well, you know, there's been so there's been so many changes, but it's kind of this exciting movement. But you yeah. were one of the first people I called to when I was like, okay, what mindset? What kind of people do I want joining me on this on this uh, Awaken a Better You cruise? And I just found with you that you was you were going to resonate with everybody. Like I mentioned, the right. elite, like those that are like the hardcores, and those that are kind of coming to you at a six a.m. boot camp, or those right. that are like, I don't want to get off my couch. Yeah, yeah. You have an ability to kind of relate to them all. 
that that was my that was my kind of key with you. Well, I think it's like I talked a little bit about earlier. It comes from practice, right? Yeah. From having all those different variety of, of clients. Um, and yes, they're working towards different goals, whether it's an athlete or uh, somebody trying to lose weight. But at the end of the day, they're trying to do the same thing and you're trying to motivate them in the same direction. And so you got to figure out different ways to do that. Mm -hmm. Come spend some time with Pat and I on our cruise. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, we got uh, six experts uh, joining me, but all of the information as to how to find uh, Pat, you're located in like right off of... Uh, just off of March Road, actually. Yeah, yeah March. So it's, turns it's more Canada yep. in terms of the actual location of the Elite Performance Academy. A yep. great spot in there, too, by the way. Uh, and nice to see you back in there full time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are you back with the Red Blacks? Do I show you even no? No, no. It's, we've uh, no. We've we continue to train a few of their players yeah. in the off season and stuff. But uh, it was just it was a too much of a time commitment between between business yeah. and family for me to do all three. Was it was a very busy year that year. Yeah. It's, it's good. I like the path that you're on. Yeah, appreciate it's good. it. It's going well. It's awesome. Fun. Thanks so much. You're welcome. Uh, you. And as we mentioned, all of those uh, places where you can find Pat uh, listed and ElitePerformanceAcademy.ca uh, if you're looking for more information. That's a wrap. That's episode 26 of Living Your Life with Leanne Lang. Once again, if you can, subscribe, like, comment. Uh, you can do that on all of the platforms. We're like on iTunes and Google Play and TuneBox and Cast, uh, CastBox and TuneIn. Uh, and then, of course, on the YouTube channel as well. Leave a comment. Ask a question. Let me know if there's some guests that you would like to have on. Uh, uh, that would also be uh, amazing, but we've had great feedback and uh, so nice to see the podcast growing. Thanks.